Hi guys, it's your science teacher here uh, with another video. This time it's on C7 energy changes. Quite a long topic, but quite a fun topic as you guys get to do a few experiments. Uh, hopefully you enjoy the video. Well done for spending some of your time uh, in order to do a bit of revision. Well done. Chemical reactions involve uh, energy being transformed from the surroundings uh, and also into the surroundings because uh, there is bond making and bond breaking going on. And whether the energy of bond breaking is more or bond making is more determines whether the reaction is exothermic and energy is given out to the surroundings or endothermic where energy is taken into the surroundings. I like to remember exothermic as uh, energy is exiting. Now the form of energy uh, we usually see is through heat. So you can tell whether a reaction is exothermic or endothermic, whether it gets hotter or colder. Exothermic, the temperature increases. Endothermic, the temperature decreases. Now endothermic is usually associated with bond making and ex endothermic is usually associated with bond breaking. And we can tell uh, whether a reaction is endothermic or exothermic by looking at reaction profiles. That shows the energy changes involved in a reaction. For an exothermic reaction, uh, it looks different than endothermic. Because for an exothermic reaction, uh, energy is given out to the surroundings, the energy of the products is less than the energy of the reactants. Now, um, it looks a bit like a humpback shape, and we'll explain why that is in a second. And endothermic, uh, the reaction profile looks like this, and the energy of the products is higher than the reactants because it's taking in energy uh, from the surrounding. The difference in height between the reactants and products is the energy uh, that has been uh, taken in from the surroundings for uh, endothermic and this will be the energy released to the surroundings for the exothermic graph. Um, but I said that the re there's a reason why it's hump shaped. Uh, it looks kind of like a camel's hump. And that's because all reactants require a bit of energy to get going. And this reactant, uh, this, this energy is known as the activation energy of the reaction. And you also have the same in the endothermic graph. Uh, you have the activation energy there. Now, there's some key reactions you need to know uh, whether they are exothermic or endothermic. And there's quite an easy way to remember it. If, it. if it gets hotter, then it's exothermic, and if it gets cooler, then it's endothermic. Well, um, just think about some exothermic reactions. Anything to do with combustion, anything that gives out heat when you burn something, that's, that's obviously going to be exothermic. The one that they like to ask about is respiration, and you can feel that respiration gives out heat. Just uh, put your hand over your mouth, okay? Uh, the air comes out a lot hotter because it's going through your body and your body, you're respiring all the time and uh, that, that energy is given out in heat. Um, some endothermic uh, reactions you need to know about. Cooking is an example because it's taking in heat from the surroundings. Think about cake, the way there's a chemical reaction going on there, okay? Bonds are being broken. Uh, and also another endothermic reaction is photosynthesis. Now there are some important um, applications of exothermic and endothermic reactions in everyday life. Think about it, have you ever had a sporting injury? They probably got out a cool pack. Um, your PE teacher probably got one out uh, of the first aid bag and all he had to do was uh, kind of crush it together and that started a chemical reaction uh, and it, it made it instantly cold. Um, that is actually an endothermic reaction that's going on. Um, now, there is some exothermic reactions as well. Um, you can have hot packs, which are also for sporting injuries, uh, but there's self-heating cans as well. And just think that they're, they're good because they save time. Um, and also, they're quite cheap to produce. You don't have to use any electricity uh, in, in making it. However, they did come with their downsides, and that's probably why you haven't seen 
uh, too many self-heating items at the shelf at your supermarket uh, is because of the fact uh, sometimes it, it doesn't really heat, uh, doesn't distribute the heat that it uh, supplies and um, also uh, it uses some toxic chemicals and if that gets into side what you're um, eating that can be very uh, detrimental. It's quite easy to see whether a reaction is endothermic or exothermic by just measuring the amount of heat given off or taken in by that reaction. Uh, you've just got to remember some key things before you, uh, you carry out the experiment. Uh, one is that you take an initial temperature reading. Um, and also, uh, you need to think about the, the variables that are important with controlling in this practical. Now, you're going to obviously need to control uh, the, the heat coming in uh, from, from the surroundings and the heat leaving the surroundings. So that's why it's better if you have a lid on top of your cup um, and also you keep your uh, plastic cup in a beaker when carrying out the experiment. Um, now this is obviously a thermometer um, and what you'd need to do in this practical is just record the temperature every few seconds uh, and then see whether the temperature goes up or down. If it goes up, remember that it's exothermic. If your temp goes up, uh, exo, and if it goes down, then it's endothermic. If you are doing the foundation paper of combined, well done, you have done amazingly. This is where it finishes for you. Uh, if you are doing triple science or the higher paper, you've just got a little bit more to go. Uh, we're gonna look at bond energies now and how to quantitatively, that means with numbers basically, uh, analyze exothermic and endothermic reactions. And the way we do that is by looking at the energy in each of the bonds. And the way I like to approach these questions and just to draw out the bonds that I have, you can see uh, the reaction I've chosen is combustion of methane. So that's the burning of methane. And if I draw it out, and we have two oxygens which look like this i remember oxygen has double bonds uh, it's covalent and it has double bonds co2 uh, that looks like this and we have two h2o and that looks like this um and the reason why i always draw it out is because it makes it easier to see them bonds and see which bonds we actually have in there so uh, on my left hand side of my equation, uh, I'll put, I'll label it left and right, it'll make it easier for you to see what I'm talking about. On my left hand side of my equation, that is all the bond breaking, okay? Because all them bonds need to be broken in order to form the products on the right hand side of the equation, they're the bond making. Now whether bond making is favoured or bond breaking is favoured will tell us whether it's exothermic or endothermic, remember. Remember, bond making is exothermic and bond breaking is endothermic. So let's do some calculations. So I've got four CH bonds. So if I go to my table and look at its bond energy in kilojoules per mole, that's 413. So that'll be 413 times by four. I have two oxygens, two double O bonds and they're worth 498 kilojoules per mole, and that will give me uh, an answer for how much my bond breaking is worth. Now let's go see how much my bond making is worth. So I have uh, one C, uh, so I have one CO2, and that means that I have two CO bonds, they're double bonds, so that will be 1079 times by two, and then add that to my two uh, waters. Now look at water, it has two OH bonds. So in total, I have four OH bonds. So it'll be four times by uh, 464 kilojoules per mole. And the answer to that is 4,014. So now to work out whether it's exothermic or endothermic, what you need to do is look at the two values for bond making and bond breaking and see which one's 
bigger. Now, as we can see, the bond making is a lot uh, bigger here. Uh, so that means my reaction is exothermic. And to work out how exothermic my reaction is, uh, I need to do the products, um, I mean the reactants minus the products, so that's 2648 minus 4014, and that should give me a negative value of minus 1366, and then kilojoules per mole. If you are doing combined science, you are finished now. But if you're doing triple science, you have just a little bit longer to go because now we're going to look at fuel cells. And you create a fuel cell when you have two different metals of different reactivity and you put them together in a solution that contains ions. So this could be an acidic solution or it could be an ionic solution. It doesn't matter. It just needs to be able to contain ions that can move. And you put in two different metals of reactivity. So we're going to look at this reactivity series again uh, that we covered in C5, chemical changes. Um, and let's just pick uh, two random metals. Let's pick magnesium and let's pick copper. So let's make one of our um, metals magnesium and one copper. Now, if I put them in there, uh, a potential difference would be created because they've got different reactivity so I'd see a voltage running through my voltmeter as there's a potential difference and this is actually how uh, batteries work. If you were to change the metals around a bit and um, see the difference of putting uh, more reactive and less reactive metals in uh, this is the kind of trend you would observe. Uh, so if this is my uh, right hand uh, if I was to uh, change the metals around a bit and play with my uh, fuel cells, uh, I, could, I could create a little table and um, see the difference in potential differences. So this is my right hand side metal and this is my left hand side metal. Uh, and uh, when, I, when I've got magnesium on the right hand side, uh, I have positive voltages running throughout. However, if it is swapped around and the magnesium is on the left hand side, it has negative voltage, but it's exactly the same type because the potential difference is just reversed, okay? Um, and look, look at this. So zinc is uh, quite close to magnesium in the reactivity series, and it produces a uh, low voltage. However, if I was to use copper, because of the fact it's quite far away, it has a higher voltage, and this is the trend that is observed with fuel cells. Now, the main problem with fuel cells is they're non-rechargeable. Uh, they will run out, okay? That's because of the fact that the ions in the solution, uh, they, they get used up. So we're going so to look at a, a, a type of fuel cell, which is um, a very, very uh, high-tech fuel cell now, um, and look at how we can uh, make it more sustainable and last longer, and it's called a hydrogen fuel cell. And hydrogen cells work by hydrogen being pumped in and the hydrogen atoms lose electrons. Only the hydrogen ions can travel through the electrolyte. So this is where the H plus ions go through and the electrons travel around the circuit. They join back up at the cathode uh, and combine with oxygen in, uh, in order to form H2O. So the only product of this reaction is water and that's incredibly desirable. Think if we weren't pumping out CO2 into our atmosphere as much and we were pumping out uh, water instead. They've looked at this technique in uh, designing cars and using hydrogen gas. We're going to look at some of the problems uh, with hydrogen cells and some of the advantages on the next slide. So like I said on the other slide, uh, water is the only product. So that's a massive advantage uh, of a hydrogen cell over a conventional uh, petrol burning car or fossil fuel um, engine such as diesel. That, 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 that's incredibly bad. It pumps out lots of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide into our atmosphere. Uh, other advantages of hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, they're incredibly quiet, okay? They're incredibly quiet when they run. Uh, you're not um, producing noise pollution uh, when you've got a hydrogen fuel cell running. 
Also, hydrogen fuel cells are very small for the amount of energy they produce. Um, so they don't need a very big one uh, for a car. Also in a spacecraft to save space, uh, they use hydrogen fuel cells. Also in space uh, craft, this is also quite interesting, uh, they actually drink the water that's produced. So uh, it's advantage if you go to space, it drinks because uh, you need to make water, obviously, for the astronauts and it produces drinking water that they can then drink. I did say, though, that hydrogen fuel cells did have a few disadvantages. There's reasons why they are not installed in every car in the country. And one disadvantage is uh, the fact that hydrogen is highly flammable. Um, and because of the fact you need to store the hydrogen inside the car, often it's in quite high pressure. Uh, if there's an ignition, if there's a bit of a uh, spark, it could go up in flames. It's That's a massive problem with hydrogen fuel cells. Also, you've got the fact of reliability. Uh, we're using, uh, currently with petrol engines, we're using technology that we know lots and lots about. Um, so people trust it. Uh, we're using older materials that people know and they know they're safe to use. And changing the perception of um, society into using hydrogen uh, fuel cells could be difficult, especially given the problems with safety. Now that is the end of the video on energy changes. I hope you really enjoyed it. Um, if you would, if you like the video, please drop it a like. And if you if you want to keep up to date with uh, more things that are being added to the channel, uh, please subscribe to my channel.